I'm pleased to welcome Chris Powder to give the special departmental seminar. Chris did his uh, bachelor's in ecology at University of Guelph and then a master's in uh, plant ecology at Guelph and then saw the light and came to Alberta and joined Alberta Environment where he worked for 29 years. The last three of which he was running the environmental impact assessment program for the province. And then after that, he joined uh, Osrin, the Oil Sands uh, Research and Information Network, where he's worked for almost the past five years, uh, trying to create and share oil sands environmental management knowledge. And he's going to share with us uh, his thoughts and reflections <coughs> and what he learned during that last five year process. So please join me in welcoming Chris. What I want to do today is kind of tell you a little bit about uh, what we did, what Osrin's about, what we did for you, because that's what we're all about, is, is making sure that people have access to information. Um, and then I want to run through 10 things that I learned while I was working here. Um, some of them are fun, some of them may be pointing at, at activities and things that happen around here. So um, just briefly about, about Osrin. Um, <clears throat> the whole idea for Osrin came up in some discussions between uh, the School of Energy and Environment, which at the time was in the School of Business, and uh, Alberta Environment around the need to have some kind of a structure where people could uh, provide funding for research, uh, but could also act as a network to bring people together, so researchers and government people and industry people. Um, so the, the school put together a proposal in 2007, sent it into uh, the Department of Environment. Um, the department granted funding in uh, two tranches, we'll talk about that, in 2008. And then um, got the program up and running and it's currently scheduled to expire at the end of December. So today's kind of a happy sad day for me, I, I get to tell you all about what we did, which is the happy part, but um, it is coming to an end at the end of December. So based on, on the proposal and the needs discussions with the department, um, there's three mandates that we've been fulfilling for the last five years. So the first is around creating knowledge, and we do that mostly through the research funding that we provided, and I'll talk about where that went and how much. Um, we also share knowledge, so the idea that uh, we want to provide the, the broadest possible range of information about oil sands so that uh, people, whether they be researchers or students, Students or government people or the great unwashed masses out in the public with balanced information about the oil sands uh, so that they can make up their own mind about whether oil sands are good or bad. And that's one of the things that really distinguishes us from a lot of other places you can go for information. They tend to be very one-sided, either pro or against. Uh, we've got a lot of information that's, that's on both sides. And I, I always get asked, well, that information that you're putting up, do you screen it? And, uh, and I say, yes, I do. I say, if, if it's going to make me throw up, then I'm not going to put it up on the website. But uh, my gag reflexes has changed a lot in the last five years, and, and because I want to provide that, that broad range of information out there. Um, there's quite a bit of stuff that I certainly don't personally believe in that's out there, and, and on both sides. So there's, there's a lot of rabid pro and there's a lot of rabid con out there. And then the third mandate that we had uh, was around networking, and it was mostly the idea of getting people together, making them aware of, of opportunities and, in, and interests. Uh, so that could be researchers to researchers, researchers to government or industry. Um, obviously, a lot of interest there on the funding side, but also on identifying needs and opportunities. A um, lot of in, uh, contacts from students looking for uh, potential jobs as postdocs or potential grad opportunities, um, which I would then funnel out to people on campus or other places. So that's kind of our three mandates. Um, I mentioned funding, so we got two grants for a total of four and a half million dollars from Hubbard Environment. Uh, we also had a, an operating grant from the Canada School of Energy and Environment, which is sort of the, the national parent of the, the School of Energy and Environment here on campus, for a quarter million dollars. And then we got some additional funds that came in from a variety of sources, including some donations, some project co-funding, some contract work that we did, and interestingly enough, there's interest that you earn on accounts in the department or in, in the university but only if it's only over a certain percentage of interest being earned at the time so we only got interest for one year and then everything went to hell. 
<clears throat> so in terms of the way that we're, we're structured, um, we have a board of directors. The board of directors was established to provide advice and guidance. They didn't tell us what to do. Uh, we, we looked to them to give us ideas about what kind of research should be done, what the priorities were, what particular things um, that they knew of that could be addressed. We're also looking for them to be our voice out into their various organizations. <clears throat> so the, the chair of the, of the board was was the head of the School of Energy and Environment. Initially it was Joseph Doucette and then when we moved from the School of Business into the Office of the Vice President of Research it was Stefan Scherer uh, who took over as the, as the head of the School of Energy and Environment and therefore the chair of the board. We have representatives from government and from uh, academia slash research institutes. Um, the initial idea was that uh, we wouldn't have industry people on the board. Um, I think in hindsight that was probably not a good idea. I think it would have been um, a little bit more effective if we had people in there, but I think the initial uh, idea was that we didn't want to have um, a potential for uh, visible conflicts of interest or even the, the appearance of conflicts of interest when we're trying to be neutral. Um, but I, again, I, I think in, in hindsight Hindsight, it would have been better to have some people on there to give us that different perspective about particularly around what needs are and what's going on in in other places so that we, we wouldn't be duplicating work <clears throat> so in terms of government representatives um, we had people from what was at the time two different departments so environment and sustainable resource development and then they got combined people from Alberta Energy and then from the oil science secretariat which was in a variety of different places but is now within Alberta Energy on the academia side, we had uh, the representative from the Canada School of Energy and Environment, <coughs> um, a couple of people from uh, U of A representing the, uh, the Office of the Vice President of Research. Um, we had one from U of C, was on there for a number of years, uh, currently isn't. <coughs> we added Nate to give that different flavor and different perspective. And we also had a rep from Alberta Innovates Energy and Environment Solutions. <coughs> and again, the, the purpose of the board was to provide us advice and guidance. Osrin was intentionally a, a lean organization, so it was basically the executive director. Um, the first, ex I, I'm not the first executive director, the first one was Dr. Stephen Moran. Some of you may know him from way back in the Alberta Research Council days. <coughs> um, Steve's a, a big brain, big picture, uh, planning kind of guy, so he, he was really interested in getting the whole structure set up and, and the overall goals and objectives, um, but he wasn't particularly interested in doing the day-to-day -day running of the organization. <clears throat> so I came in to do the day-to-day -day stuff because that's what I really like doing, doing implementation, getting things off the ground, and uh, particularly the information side of things. <clears throat> and then we had support staff. So um, we've had a number over the years. Uh, currently we have one person who's working basically one day a week. So um, not a lot of overhead in terms of uh, people. We did have uh, a couple of MBA students working on a project for us, and you can decide whether that's a project or staff, but that's basically all the people that we had for the, the five years. So we did uh, a variety of, of research projects, um, and we, we uh, set up some focus areas. The first three are the ones that were the primary goals and objectives for the organization. They were set up before I came in, so no surprise when you're talking about all sense. You're gonna do work on tailings, you're gonna do work on reclamation, and you're gonna do work on monitoring. Um, the other two are, are, uh, were set up so that the um, increasing awareness is all about um, uh, the website site but also funding out for conferences and some other things to get more information out to people. The social, economic and regulatory is kind of a catch-all to get in other projects and we, we tackled uh, uh, quite a range of projects in there. And then the strategic direction one was mostly projects that started off early on uh, while Osram was getting up and running. Um, Steve spent a lot of time getting people together to think about how, how to structure ourselves, what to focus on, um, how to uh, leverage opportunities, and to set that kind of larger strategic direction. And so uh, we're also interested in seeing on the information sharing side of things, um, what kind of tools were out there, how you could leverage um, different ways of getting information out to people. So that's mostly around what the strategic direction um, projects were. We didn't do anything for a number of years. We did one last project in here, which is the survey of research inf and information needs that we just finished. 
And the, the chart kind of shows you the distribution uh, of where the funding went. So again, the, the three key ones. But um, interestingly enough, we, we ended up with a lot more monitoring projects than I think the original intent was. Uh, I think the primary focus was going to be around tailings and reclamation. <clears throat> One of the reasons for that is that there's so many other organizations covering off tailings and reclamation. So on the industry side, as well as on SEMA, the Cumulative Environmental Management side. <clears throat> so there weren't a lot of projects that we could get involved in that weren't already being contemplated by other people. So in, in the time that we've been here, what have we done for you? Um, to date, uh, actually, I should have updated this because now it's 46 research reports. I just sent one out this morning. Uh, about 16 more to come uh, in the next four weeks. Um, all things going properly. Uh, we also did a number of workshops that we held mostly on campus here. So there's 11 reports out of that. Um, we got somewhere around engaged about 500 plus people in those workshops. So there was, there was a lot of interest. It was interesting because I got comments from people saying, well, how do you get all these people to come to these workshops? Workshops. You're paying them, right? It's no, I don't pay people to come to workshops. They want to come, and they come. And and he looked around. And he said, "Well, there's some pretty high-powered people here. How do you do that?" I said, "Well, it's just interesting. I, I think what we did was provide a, a safe venue for people to talk about things that they were interested in. And I, I think that's a really good way to set up um, workshops if you're thinking about doing that kind of thing. Never attribute comments to people. You just pull together quickly as possible information, get it back out to people so that they can see the products coming out of it. Um, so I'm, I'm a product guy, I really want to get reports out for everything that we do, but there were other formats that we played with. So we worked with Suzanne Bailey and her crew on campus here and put together a YouTube video um, which has got a lot of hits, a lot of interest. It's available as a regular on a computer video as well as on handhelds in, in a sequence of nine sub videos because you can't have really big ones in there. Um, and it was looking at the work that she did with Albert Innovates and others at how you go about sampling reclaimed oil sands marshes using her uh, index of biotic integrity. <clears throat> we also put together with um, Matthew Piper and others on campus here um, a little brochure or a handbook on using woody debris with pictures to, to uh, show people what it would look like on the ground as opposed to having your typical text and numbers type approach. Um, we also have one report that's our, a compilation of all our revegetation species profiles, but then we took them out as individual basically like leaflets so it could be two to three pages and you can pull them off the web or online um, and they're ideal if you're heading out to the field or you're just working on one particular species and you don't want to go through the, the massive report you can just go grab that and have information at hand. Um, the mandate for Osrin in terms of funding wasn't that we had to spend every cent on campus here. Uh, we, were, we were fully open to spend it outside. So we did fund consultants, we did fund uh, Albert Innovates Tech Futures, we funded other institutions, uh, but we spent a lot of money on campus here. So just a shade over a million dollars in terms of research projects that we funded here, 32 of them on campus. Um, we also uh, provided opportunities through those research projects for 62 students to participate and I think that was one of the things that I really wanted to do is make sure that this is, <clears throat> you know, we all play this game, right? I, I give a grant to a prof but we all know that it's not really the prof that's doing the work, it's the students. And this is a way of making sure that, that they get recognized for the work that they did. Um, the profs were really good about including their names on the reports many times as lead authors as opposed to the profs. And again, I think that's a, a really good way for students to uh, get involved. One of the ways I tried to sell the projects to people on campus and elsewhere was uh, a lot of our projects were going to be lit reviews, which a student is going to have to do anyway as part of their thesis. And I said, you know, you can get them A, some money to begin with in the time when they don't necessarily have a lot of money coming because they're not really doing their core work. And they can get a publication out of it without a lot of sweat, right? And so it's good for everybody. And that seemed to work quite well. Uh, we also funded um, Nate, Mount Royal, U of C, U of L, University of Saskatchewan, UBC, and Simon Fraser. So a lot of academic institutions, and then as I said, consultants and other research organizations too. As part of the uh, information sharing thing, one of the things that I noticed when I came on board um, 
is that there, it's really difficult to go and find out where all this information is related to the oil sands. And so I looked around at various bibliographies that were available and there were some but they were either not kept up to date or they were, they were very difficult to use or they were much broader than just the environmental management side of oil sands. So <clears throat> I sat down with SEMA and said, you guys have one, you created it but it hasn't been maintained or updated since 2007. Why don't we take this, make it much better, a lot easier to use for people and up update all the content. <clears throat> so we provided them a couple of grants and we took it from about just under 400 references that were in there up to 2007 and it's now sitting at 3,161 plus or minus um, and it goes all the way from 1914 to 2015 and I like putting 2015 in there because I found out that journals are like new car models they actually come out uh, the year ahead <clears throat> so there, there's four or five 2015 records in the in the bibliography. Wherever possible, uh, we tried to provide links to either at least an abstract, uh, if it's available, and the whole document. So that's one of the things that's really good about this bibliography compared to others is you can get right into the document. Um, each of the, the columns in there is sortable. Uh, so you can sort by name, by date, by title, uh, by year. Um, you can sort in, in including um, whether or not you, if you're looking just for things that have links, you can sort on the links column and you can get the ones that, are, that just have links. <clears throat> you can also export one, several, or all of the uh, records that come out of your search either into Excel or Word. Um, it's not the prettiest thing in the world, I'll admit that, but it's a heck of a lot better than retyping it in yourself or cutting and pasting. Um, and uh, it's it's relatively easy, uh, user friendly. So there's lots of keywords in there. Um, again, uh, the nice thing about the way this is set up is that one person, which is me, did all the keywording. So it's relatively consistent. And if you're gonna pick one, you're probably gonna get all of those kinds of records at one time. Uh, whereas if you get multiple people doing that, then of course they're gonna have different perspectives on what's important in each of the references. Um, we're working right now to figure out what to do with it on a go-forward basis. One of the things that Seema said when we ta started talking to them about where we should create this bibliography was, well, we're going to live longer than you are, so it should really be here, and we'll promise to keep it up to date. Um, <clears throat> so they're still trying to figure out whether they will be here longer than I am. Uh, and so we're looking at different opportunities, um, one of which might be the Athabasca University, because they already have a bibliography of a broader uh, focus, which is the whole Athabasca River Basin area, but they're looking at it and saying it might be interesting for them. So the other thing that, that I said when I came on board is um, there's a lot of historical information out there, but a lot of people don't know about it. And it's mostly because, and not to pick on young people, but that's just the way it is, right? It, <clears throat> the first place that they go to look for information is on the web. And if it's not on the web, it never existed because it was done by old people and therefore it's not on the web, right? So <clears throat> we said, well, okay, there's a way to overcome that. I'll, I'll give in and agree that that's the case. So uh, we got a whole bunch of the old documents. We digitized them. So we've done 378 today. We've done all of the, the um, documents out of the old Alberta Oil Science Environmental Research Program, which coincidentally is where I started working when I came into Alberta Environment. Some of the reports from the Reclamation Research Technical Advisory Committee, the ones that focused in particular on the oil sands, but also some of the mountain mines, because there's a lot of similarities there. Um, a number of government policy documents and, and old research documents from environment and sustainable resource development. We got health on board, um, late last year and got some of their reports, the early ones that were about uh, uh, some of the releases to the river and some other things which are really interesting to read. And we've just worked with Syncrude and we're in the process of digitizing their uh, historical Syncrude research monograph and their professional paper series as well. So probably somewhere around 50 of those are gonna go up uh, on the web again in the next few weeks. Um, People started looking at this and saying, well, you're, you're putting all these things out there. This is really cool. We've got some documents um, and you seem to have a really good system set up and you seem to be able to get the information out to people. Would you host our documents? Sure, why not? It's all about getting information out to people. So we've got um, 
documents from uh, U of A, so Suzanne Bailey's work that she did for Alberta Innovates. It's posted here. It's in, it's in other places, and that's okay. Um, but we want to be able to have documents that, that are easily accessible to people. Um, we also have one from uh, Kevin DeVito and Carl Mendoza that talks about some Conrad work. Uh, we uh, were approached by Environment Canada to host one of theirs, and we've got that. Um, also, a recent report done by, it's called the Tailings Dam Committee, and it's basically looking at uh, steps you'd need to do to delicense an oil sands tailings dam. They needed a home and uh, came to us. And we've got two more coming, maybe today or tomorrow, from Alberta Environment that we're going to put up. Um, again, I think that's something that's, that's a good thing to know, right? If people are looking for opportunities, if you can provide a, a hosting system to get information out, and that's what my mandate was, but I think it's the mandate of the university too, right? Then we should try and make um, as much effort as we can to do that. Our website was our primary vehicle for getting information out to people. Um, again, it's all about providing that balanced information. So we had daily news feeds. We got tons and tons of links in there. Lots of videos, which are really good tools um, for teaching. Um, you know, maybe at this level, but certainly at the high school level, it covers pretty well all the subjects that one can imagine in those videos. Um, <clears throat> and some of them go really far back. So there's some radio inter interviews from just before Suncor was starting which are really interesting to listen to. There's a really cool video of the Trans Mountain Pipeline when it was first built back in the 50s. Uh, slightly different technology than today, but really neat to have a look at. Um, we put together a glossary of terms and acronyms. Uh, acronyms, probably true. Um, <clears throat> acronyms, um, yeah. Uh, because again, uh, there's so much terminology out there um, and we just wanted to have a single place where we could start to gather all of this. Um, and uh, it's again, it's, it's been a really popular document in, in terms of people downloading it. Um, we put the, I started putting together uh, what, I'm, what I call the Did You Know series. So it, it's mostly meant for the, the general public, although there's some really cool stuff for, for uh, uh, people who have a lot more knowledge as well. But it was mostly about trying to generate interest in the whole subject there. So we've got, we've got the, the one about, did you know that there was a proposal to set off a nuclear bomb to, you know, to uh, heat up the oil? Because wouldn't that be much better for the environment than what we got today? Um, there's stuff about uh, royalties. There's stuff about costs. There's stuff about environmental things. There's stuff about people. It, it's just really meant to, to capture people's imagination and say, well, maybe I should look into this a little bit more. Um, we started a few years ago a newsletter as well. So we asked people to sign up for it because um, even though people really want information, everyone's really busy. And so you really have to push stuff out to them. Um, I consider it to be pretty good when we get 40% of the people actually opening it up and uh, you know a little bit less actually clicking on something because they have an interest. N I would like to believe that they all would have come to the site anyway, but I know that that's not the case, right? So if you have something that you want to get out to people, you need to push it to them. Even then, not everyone's going to get it, even if they're really keen. Uh, but we're, we're at somewhere around 273 people on the mailing list, um, and that's not bad, right? There, that's a fair number of people that you're, you're getting information out to. I have always been, throughout my career, all about giving people information. Whether you use it or not, how you use it, that's up to you. But if you, if you don't have someone give it to you, you, then you may not even be aware of it, right? 